Good morning, good morning. How's everyone doing this great day? I think maybe our coolness is over. I'm not sure if we're going to get any rain or not. Any more rain this week or not? It was really nice getting that rain, though. Let's we'll start with a real prayer. Thank you, Lord, so much for this time. We get to look in your word and it, uh, gleam a little more uh, understanding uh, from your word. And hopefully we can use it to a uh, better... Uh, worship you and to uh, uh, follow you. We give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Lots of little lessons in here uh, in, uh, in Genesis here and these different stories that we see Abraham going through. And uh, I think it's uh, been an interesting study so far. I can admit I've learned a few things. Quite a few things, actually. So... Uh, I'll continue with this map, kind of keep us uh, in tune of where we're at. I'll be talking about Bathsheba a little bit today. And let's see, some verses. Oh, there we go somewhere. Where are my verses? Good. So we're in uh, Genesis 20, uh, 21, actually. And we'll start off here, and that's where we left off yesterday. With this verse, actually, we'll see, we just read this one to get, uh, remember where we were yesterday. And it came to pass at this time, that time that Abl Abimelech and Fight Shaul, the chief of captain of his host, spake unto Abraham, uh, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. So remembering Abraham, uh, Abimelech, remember that uh, he was involved with the uh, whole uh, Sarah incident. There's actually one commentary I read that, that, that uh, there may be some evidence that this is a different Abimelech than that one. But I'll mention it anyway, since the name is identical. And it's all within the last couple of chapters. That's over. Let me just finish reading this section first. And, it, and now therefore swear unto me here by God that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son. But according to the kindness that I have done unto you, thou shalt do unto me, into the land wherein thou hast sojourned. See, that gives me a little bit of a hint that they, they have a prior relationship. And Abraham said, I will swear. So they're in agreement here. This is back in the days where a man's word was definitely worth its weight in gold. Uh, you could you could go to the bank with it. And uh, I got to admit that even even with, even up until my generation, uh, that, was, that was still a solemn vow. I still believe it's still true in some places. But it's getting to the point where, what are you going to, you know, the, the basic comeback is, what are you going to do, sue me? Uh, you know, this is a sue uh, type uh, society where the a man's honor uh, has kind of like gone by the wayside a bit. But that used to be that a handshake was all that was necessary. It was actually admissible in court, too. You had a witness of uh, somebody sh uh, shaking hands. That was enough. You didn't need a piece of paper. That was how the West was won, as they say. Um, I can't read the verses. <laughs> so let's uh, look at Abimelech a little bit. Going back to Genesis 20, verse 2. And this is the incident with Sarah. And Abraham said of, of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gear, sent and took Sarah. So you remember that story. I won't read through the whole thing, but it ends up finding out that Sarah is uh, theoretically his uh, uh, was his sister and, and his wife because uh, they had the same uh, father but different mothers is what it came out to be. And so he wasn't completely lying, but he wasn't completely telling the truth either on that one. And also going to Genesis 26.6, which we'll get to uh, uh, towards the end of the week, I uh, know next week. Then Abimelech went to him from Gear and 
But see, he's still from Gear, so that, that tells me it's the same Abimelech. And Hezareth, one of his friends, and Pichal, the chief captain of his army. So we see that also mentioned in both places that we're going to talk about here in a minute. That relationship of trust developed, and uh, coming back, to, uh, going to Genesis 20, verse 14 through 18. Now, Blumelech took sheep and oxen and men servant and mates, women servants, and gave them to Abraham and restored him Sarah, his wife. And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee, dwell where it pleases thee. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of thy eyes, unto all that thou art with thee, and with all other. Thus she was reproved. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife, and his maidservants, and they bare children. So basically, God had put a curse on Abimelech at that time because he took Sarah to be his wife. But it never got quite that far right, from what did. I get an idea behind that whole I thing, though, that there might have been a little bit of knowledge that uh, she, that Sarah shouldn't have known about, uh, but it never did got all the way to any kind of a physical thing. That's just a guess on my part. But, but now they've come, and now we've uh, jumped ahead. And, uh, and we're, and we're, we're still in the same area. And it becomes an incident about wells. And wells in this time frame were really important. You're talking about the desert. So a well was a, a well-managed resource. And it was even wars fought over wells. Uh, that's how, how much. And we're going to see a little story here develop where uh, Abraham and Abimelech are going to make this covenant. And at, at first, we're going to see that Abraham is a little upset because some people from his... Uh, his kingdom uh, went and, uh, and and by force took control of one of the, uh, one of Abraham's wells. So they're going to set up this deal, uh, and Abraham wants to make sure that uh, that what's included in this is that uh, he's aware of that incident, and he claims he didn't know anything about it. Let's just read through that. Oh, one more verse in this one. For the Lord hath fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. That was the end of that story. Now back to where, now we're back to the Philistines filled. Uh, so basically what happened is the Philistines, uh, after this uh, period of time of the covenant, is actually going to come back and fill in the uh, the wells that uh, Abraham is getting ready to dig. So you see that, uh, uh, at least we're going to see that uh, Abimelech kept to his word as long as Abraham was alive. And this actually goes all the way into Isaac's time frame too, which we'll talk about when we get to verse 26. Just a little taste of it right here. 26, 15, for all the wells which his father's servants have dug in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines have stopped them and filled them with earth. So you can see there was a, a definite animosity between the Philistines and the Israelites. And that goes on to today. Uh, the Philistines are basically the people group of uh, the current day uh, uh, Muslims and uh, particularly in the area of, I think, Gaza is uh, the general area where they came from. So it seems at least while Abraham was alive, that Blumen did honor the covenant. And now we're going to talk about that covenant. I find this kind of fascinating because I don't know how they, how they, uh, they make sure this time that there's witnesses to the covenant. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Genesis 21, 25. And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. That's the incident. And Abimelech entered more into a wise man. Oh, so I just wanted to mention here to a couple of proverbs. And by the way, and because these these wells were actually dug by hand, realize that that, that they didn't have drilling equipment back then, so that uh, it was quite a bit of work to build to dig, dig a well. But, uh, but some proverbs that kind of show us uh, uh, some things that take into consideration when we're talking about deals. A reproof entered more into a wise man than a hundred stripes into a fool. So when a man now realizes that uh, that the reproof is basically that uh, he had a complaint. And if you do it to a fool, that typically it doesn't go very far. But to a wise man, it means a lot. 
and also Proverbs 25, 9. Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself and discover not a secret to another. Uh, this is another really important proverb that, uh, uh, is that when you have a problem with a brother, you're supposed to go to the brother and, uh, uh, and, and deal with directly with the brother, not to go behind his back or gossip about him and, and, uh, and do things of that nature. And Jesus also comments on this over in Matthew 18, 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Really important. So over Genesis 21, 26. Seems that Abimelech says he did not know of this and based on the statement in verse 23, expected Abraham to respect the covenant also. So let's take a look at this. Now, Abimelech said, I will not who hath done this, neither didst thou tell me, neither yet heard I of it, but today. So Abimelech is saying he never heard about anything about this. And uh, we're just, uh, and it's interesting that back in verse 23, that Abimelech was also uh, concerned that Abraham was going to was going to honor this covenant uh, to his sons and his sons' sons after him. And this is where he says that back in verse 23. Now therefore swear unto me here by God that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son, but according to the kindness that I have done unto thee. Thou shalt do unto me and to the land where thou hast sojourned. So you can see that Abraham Blumenich expected Abraham to honor his commitment. And now Abraham is also making sure that uh, Blumenich honors his portion of the uh, contract also. So continuing on, Genesis 21, 27. And Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Blumenich. And both of them made a covenant. And Abraham sent seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. Now Blumach said unto Abraham, What mean these seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by themselves? This is the witnesses. <laughs> and he said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. And this is not the only time that, that this has ever been used as a type of witness. Uh, Jumping way ahead of Genesis 31, got a neat little story here talking about Jacob. Well, the uh, interesting symbology here where they're using sheep as a witness has some kind of a cultural meaning behind it. And because there's seven of them, I, have, I believe it has something to do uh, with divine uh, intervention uh, when it comes to using seven usually is the, uh, is the number of completion. And so it, uh, there's, a, there's definitely a meaning behind the number seven here, where he's got seven ewe lambs. If you didn't know, ewe lambs are actually the, the women, the, the female uh, sheep. Let's see, uh, uh, where was I? Oh, I'm going to talk about this story. But similar things are, uh, are used as witnesses over in Genesis 31, 44 through 48. Let's take a look. Now therefore come thou, let us make a covenant, and I am thou, and let it be for a witness between me and thee. And Jacob took a stone and set it for a pillow, a pillar. And Jacob said, said unto his brethren, Gather stones, and they took stones and made a heap, and they did eat there upon the heap. And Laban called the Jaga Sheridulatha, but Jacob called it Gilead. And then Laban said, The heap is a witness between me and thee this day. Therefore was the name of it called Gilead. Gilead, or probably Gilead. The heap be witness and the pillar be witness that I will not pass over this heap to thee, and thou shalt not pass over this heap, this pillar under me for harm. So you can see that they use this pile of rocks as a witness to basically say that uh, uh, this witness is going to be a reminder to both of us where the property line is. Okay, so back to uh, our current text, Genesis 21, 31. Wherefore, they called the place Bathsheba, because they were swore, both of them. And that's what Bathsheba actually means, the well of oath, or the well of the seven, uh, alluding to the seven ewe lambs. Kind of interesting, that's what the word means. 
the verb rendered to swear is derived from the word translated seven. Actually, uh, you know, the word translated seven is actually another term to mean uh, uh, to swear. And a few examples of this over in Genesis 21, 14. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Another mention of Beersheba. It's all through the Bible. It's still there today. Uh, it's a town in uh, Israel. And I was going to Genesis 26, 23 through 25. And he went up from thence to Bathsheba. And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of thy Abraham, the father. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord. And then pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged a well. So this is going to happen again, that Isaac is going to redig this well at Bathsheba after the Philistines fill it in. Also over in Joshua, this is the inheritance of the tribe of Judah, according to their families. Jumping down to verse 28, and Hashuela and Bathsheba and Bejizajah. Uh, Bathsheba was, a, uh, was used as a marking point for one of the tribes. Then all the children of Israel went out and the congregation was gathered together as one man from Dan, even to Bathsheba, uh, with the land of Gilead unto the Lord and uh, Mizpah. Uh, it was also a boundary line of the area that was set aside for the, uh, the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, so you'll just see that term quite a bit uh, from Dan to Bathsheba. Dan is way up in the north. Uh, it's not on this map, but it's basically up here uh, near Damascus. Second Samuel 1711. Therefore I counsel thee that all Israel be generally gathered unto thee, from Dan even to Bathsheba, as the sand that is by the sea for a multitude, and that they go to battle in thine own person. First Kings 425. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Bathsheba, all the days of Solomon. So that 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 Word is used quite a bit in a lot of different ways. On to, back to Genesis 21, 32. Thus they made a covenant at Bathsheba. Uh, then uh, Blimech rose up and uh, Peshaw, the chief captain of the host, and they returned into the land of the Philistines. That verse right there tells us uh, three things. That Abimelech is associated with Peshaw, the chief captain, and that they're both from Philist they're both the Philistines. I'm going to mention some about the Philistines here in a minute. But lots of history with these people, the Philistines. Uh, some other references to it are in Genesis 26, 8. For some reason, I didn't put these in here. Uh, they're, they're here. They're just down below. Why did I put this? I put that in the wrong place. Okay. So 26 8. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abuna, king of Philistines, looked out at the window and saw and beheld Isaac was supporting with Rebecca, his wife. Mother, that's some more history so that uh, Abuna is still going to be around even when we get to Isaac and his wife, uh, Rebecca. And a similar thing is going to happen with uh, these two that happened with Abraham and Sarah. And also 26, 14, for he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and great store of servants. And the Philistines envied him. So this is another problem that uh, the Philistines are starting to envy the Israelites. And so uh, this conflict that's been going back and forth between uh, the Philistines and the uh, uh, and the Israelites has been going on for a long time, 4,000 years. And also in Judges 13, 1. 
And the children of Israel did evil again, again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. But this is one time that the Philistines actually took over. But here comes uh, the most famous Philistine that we know uh, well and love, and, and that's uh, the famous story of David and Goliath. Goliath was a Philistine. Uh, it's an, as Goliath was a Philistine. We see this over in 1 Samuel 17, 1 through 4, and then I'll jump down to 23 and 51. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at uh, Shukha, which belongeth to Judea, and pitched between Shukloth and Ezekiah. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. I forget that works out to it. A cubit is around uh, either from 18 to 21 inches. So he was somewhere around 120 inches tall. Is that 10 feet? Jump down to verse 23. And as they talked with him, behold, there came up the uh, champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And of course, we know David is going to kill Goliath uh, with the power with the power of God behind him. That's down in verse 51. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew out of the sheath thereof and slew him, cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Which reminds me too that in times past, uh, allies who now are our enemy, uh, the Philistines went back and forth with being friend or foe. And uh, I, remember, I can remember vividly that when I was first in school in the uh, Air Force down in uh, Mississippi, that I saw Iraqi soldiers being trained by our military. Uh, and, uh, I, and I even seen Iranian soldiers being trained in our country. So it, uh, it's funny, uh, friend or foe, sometimes uh, uh, there's an old saying is, uh, particularly in the military, is that uh, you keep your friends close and you keep your enemy closer. I mean, you keep an eye on them. You never know when they're going to change on you. But another one is Russia. Uh, prior to World War II, we were allies. And now we're not allies, that's for sure. So the uh, same thing is going to happen here with Philistines too, because we can see that uh, they're warring each other here in David's time. But you come back to this time and they're friends. Moving on here, verse 33. And we... Uh, and Abraham planted a grove in Bathsheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. You see, Abraham spent a good part of his life here. And as it says, he sojourned in a, is a temporary situation, just like when we are, uh, as it is, our not permanent homes here. Let me just finish reading verse 34 here. And Abraham sojourned in Philistines uh, land many days. So he basically lived there. But, it, but you see that word sojourned. It's very similar to uh, the same situation we're in, is that we're, uh, we don't consider earth our permanent home. Our home is in heaven with the Lord. And I like the analogy of uh, ambassadors for Christ. And that's actually biblical. As whenever there is going, uh, whenever you see a war going on in, in the world, first thing that a country does is they'll pull their ambassadors home. And I think the same analogy can be taken uh, of God's people, uh, that we're ambassadors for Christ and when, uh, and when the day comes that uh, God is going to uh, uh, bring wrath upon the world, he's going to pull his ambassadors home. And again, this is actually biblical. It's in 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ. For as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. But he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the, uh, that's the uh, adoption into God's family, uh, an heir to Jesus Christ. And we see this also talked about, uh, in, uh, that Jesus talked about over in Luke 2.49. This is that when he was a young boy uh, in the temple, and he was commenting back to his mother Mary. And he said unto them, how is it that, that you sought me? Was you not that I must, must be about my father's business? And so that's... Uh, 
until we're called home, that's what we should be doing, uh, being about our father's business and making sure that we spread the gospel as much as we can. So that's what I had for today, uh, a little bit shorter than usual. And I uh, hope that was a blessing, and we'll get into the next section, into the next chapter, uh, starting tomorrow. That's chapter 22. Let's see what's in chapter 22. Oh, okay, the famous uh, story of uh, Abraham and Isaac are going to be a, uh, a foretelling of a similar situation where a father is going to offer his son, uh, but his son goes through with it. And so we'll talk about that tomorrow. That's a great story and has a lot of links uh, to the current place uh, in Jerusalem where they believe it happened. So I'll leave you with that little hint. If you want to read ahead, go ahead. Chapter 22. Michelle, we'll get to it tomorrow. Oh, thank you, Lord. Uh, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, so much for this insight into your, your thought process and the things that you uh, think about. And I love learning more and more about you, Lord. Keep helping us to understand you so that we can have a joyous life and be ever honoring to you. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. So you have a great day, and uh, we will see you to, uh, tonight at, uh, at prayer service. And look forward to that. And I'm sure Pastor has a good message for us. So we will uh, we'll see you then.